Okay, welcome everyone to this continuation of what is algebraic geometry. Today I have a topic um, which is a bit difficult for me because I like it a lot, but I hate this. I hate the word. I just hate the word. It's just terrible. It's impossible to write. It's impossible to pronounce. It's actually not so bad, but it's somehow somehow my brain doesn't like it. Um, somehow I have difficulties with sheafification. Sheafification. It's kind of a. I don't know who came up with this word. I would call it a free sheaf. Um, and yeah, we will. I will explain why I actually would call it a uh, free sheaf as we go along in this video. Huh? Okay, but otherwise, yeah, people call it sheafification, and yeah, whatever. It's kind of a fun name or a bad name or uh, whatever it is. So it's a following idea. Let's do math and not me waffling around. Um, so we had pre sheaves and we had sheaves. So pre sheaves is really just a collection of spaces that behave nicely by under restriction, right? That, that's essentially what a pre sheaf was. I hope everyone at this point likes uh, this kind of picture here um, for a pre sheaf. And a sheaf was something with an additional local, local gluing property, um, like in the vector field, where you can kind of get the middle vector field by gluing the, the two top vector fields together. So those two. They get kind of glued together along the middle vector field and everything kind of fits nicely um, together. So essentially a sheaf is always from kind of always something local, while a pre sheaf is just a collection of something you attach to open sets, such that they behave nicely within the sections of open sets. Okay? So the sheaf example um, would be continuous functions. Uh, continuous is a local property. And yeah, and you can clearly just restrict to open subsets, not a problem. Um, similarly, you can restrict to open subsets for a bounded function, but being bounded is not really a local property. And indeed, that's an example of a non sheaf. It's a prior sheaf that is not a sheaf. Yeah? Continuous function sheaf, bounded functions just a prior sheaf. Okay. And similarly for rational functions, so being a rational function, like a, a quotient f, well, this is what's supposed to be an f, I'm not sure what happened here, f over g is not a local property, right? You can't read that off locally. So that's a, a, a pre sheaf, but not a sheaf. Right? And again, rational function restrict nicely, so it's a pre sheaf anyway. So anyway, that's kind of a little bit strange. So sheaves is kind of something local. And you might ask, is there actually a way to make pre sheaves, which are kind of everywhere? It's not a very restrictive condition for a pre sheaf. Can you somehow make them into sheaves? And I find this question a bit, well, I'm, I'm very su always very surprised. To me, it looks like that shouldn't be possible. Uh, because a pre sheaf is, has no local properties at all. And the sheaf is essentially just defined by its local properties. And uh, turns out that you can, which I find very surprising. But there will be a huge catch. The way you do it is somewhat throwing away information. That's maybe the price you have to pay um, in this case to go from pre sheaves to sheaves. And the process has a name, and hopefully you're not very surprised if the name is what I really don't. Well, <laughs> whatever. I shouldn't bullshit too much on sheafification, um, but somehow I, I I don't know. Sheafification is this, this process. I will call it a free sheaf. Eventually. So regular functions, quotients by polynomials. Yeah. So p over q or f over g. Yes. In my previous or the previous slide, that's clearly a pre sheaf. Right. It behaves nicely under under restriction. So those guys here, right, these are regular functions. And you can't read off locally whether they're regular functions. So this one could be anything locally, essentially. So regular functions do not form a sheaf. Right? Regular functions simply do not form a sheaf. Um, and that's why we had this notion of locally regular functions or local regular functions. That is when we have a neighborhood such that locally it's a P over Q, which is by definition a local property. Okay, one of them is somehow more natural, the pre sheaf one, and the other one is a bit artificial, where you just have a local condition, but it's a sheaf. And kind of the main observation here is that one sits in the other. Yeah? So one clearly sits in the other. Um, so there must be some way of doing that. Yeah? So there must be some way of making a, the pre sheaf into a sheaf, because every regular function is, of course, also a locally regular function. Yeah? One sits in the other. 
you kind of lose a lot. You add a lot more functions if you go from regular functions to local regular functions. Yeah? Um, or you gain a lot. I would call it you lose a lot because some of the restriction on the function, the regular function is just better behaved than locally regular functions. And sometimes you lose a lot. But you go from a sheaf to a uh, pay sheaf to a sheaf. And the same thing, thing happens for the other example for bounded functions. So bounded functions, and let's just make them continuous just for fun. Bounded functions are clearly not local. Uh, being bounded is not a local property. It could go off to infinity. Uh, at infinity if you want like a polynomial or something but continuous is clearly a local condition essentially it's the example of a local condition maybe the first local condition you ever meet in your mathematical life is continu continuity right so, so you don't have any uh, gaps in your function it's clearly a local condition and again one of them sits in the other yeah? so a bounded continuous function is a continuous function so it actually sits in continuous functions. And yeah, so our pre sheaf here sits actually in a sheaf. So maybe what you're supposed to do is to just make our pre sheaf so large um, that it becomes local. And that's kind of what you do. So you make it very, very large, which uh, is a kind of a very general concept. And there is a, well, there's a canonical way of doing this. Um, and that's kind of the point. So sheafification is a canonical sheaf that it can associate to a prey sheaf and it has some definition which I will not read out, I will give you an alternative definition. But um, if you want to read it you can go to the Stacks project which is excellent anyway, so if you google Stacks project you will find the Stacks project. It's one of my favorite website wikis I guess um, and you'll find a lot of algebraic geometry motivated uh, mass around Stacks, hence the name. Anyway, I will not need this definition, but there is a kind of a definition that you just write it down. Okay. Anyway, and chiefification of, well, is this process that takes rational functions and makes them, well, considers them as locally rational functions. It takes bounded continuous functions and considers them as continuous functions, which is somehow a very, very boring process in some sense. Um, and I always get very confused because chiefification is such a, as I said, such a fancy name and in the end you just forget things <laughs> it's it's not it's not that exciting actually and it makes sense there shouldn't be um uh, a really good way to associate uh, a, a sheaf to a prey sheaf because one of them is local keep that in mind if you don't have anything local where should your sheaf come from but there's a canonical way canonical doesn't mean good canonical just means there's a categorical way of doing it it's not necessarily good. There is no good way to associate to a general prey sheaf a sheaf, whatever good means. Um, so you'll always sell a kind of pay a price. And there's a better explanation which I will do um, on the next slide and I will come back to master's batch drawings in a second. So this little picture down here, which I will make bigger anyway. So the reason I call sheafification, like to call this free sheaves, is there is this idea in, in category theory which you don't need to know if you're only interested in algebraic geometry. So that's why I will oh, come back to that in a second. So you kind of can ignore it and you can go back to the sex project and really read about the algebraic geometry definition of chiefification. But some of the slicker way of doing it is the saying the following. So very often in mathematics you have, you have the free forget adjunction. There's a forgetful functor which is usually easy from vector spaces to sets, which forgets that you have a vector space, um, that you have a linear structure, just uh, look at the underlying set. And that thing has a left adjoin, which is called the free construction, and it assigns to a set its free vector space. So there's a canonical, not a good way, but there's a canonical way to associate a vector space to a set. There's a free vector space. And this is exactly what happens for sheafification as well. There's a forgetful functor from sheaves to prey sheaves. You just forget that you have a sheaf. Huh? You forget your local properties. There's, you still get a prey sheaf. And it has a left adjoint, and that's exactly the sheafification. So in that sense, sheafification is like the free sheaf. Uh, free sheaves tend to be large. That's why you kind of lose all, like go from bounded continuous functions to um, continuous functions. Yeah? So it's like you really, really lose uh, we kind of lose a lot of structure if you want, but I kind of make it very large. I, I really like this analogy here from set going to the k-linear vector space. So if you take a 
whatever, the, the, K, the, the free vector space on the natural numbers is actually a really large vector space. They usually do something very large. Okay, and this is kind of the category theory um, kind of approach. And I want to kind of a little bit complain that category theory is somehow not on the standard curriculum. That's what I wanted to do. And then I found uh, this actually funny, really nice, funny well, comic, whatever you want to call it, on Masters Bad Drawings. So if you don't know what Masters Bad Drawings is, you can just Google it. You will find it and it's kind of really excellent. They don't even have bad drawings. They just have mass jokes. And essentially it works as follows. So why is category theory not in the mass curriculum? Because um, it's not obvious what you should put on it, right? So everyone agrees it's kind of messy. Yeah? Look at this mess. Yes, just look at it. It's clear what we need to do. Yeah, absolutely clear. Everyone agrees that the mass curriculum is a mess. And then they come up with, everyone comes up with their own idea what to do. And yeah, so uh, pff, it will not change anytime soon as far as, I, as far as I can tell. So you might actually argue that maybe category theory is completely misplaced, misplaced on the mass curriculum. You should do machine learning. And I kind of agree with that. Yeah? But anyway, so the, the reason why category theory is not a more traditional field of mathematics in the sense of a curriculum is there are other things that need to be taught. Right? Would you really cut it for calculus? I, I, I don't know. But it's sometimes, and that's the whole point here, sometimes it's just a very efficient way of explaining something. And this chiefification, again, I don't like the word, I always got freaked out by the word, and it sounded very difficult to me, in the category theory sense, is really just a free sheaf. And then it made sense to me at least. So hopefully it makes some sense uh, to you as well, if I just explained it like I did with category theory. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video, and I also hope to see you next time.